Let's very, very briefly talk about uh, writing Lewis structures for organic molecules. Uh, the reason I say very, very briefly is because if you need to know how to draw organic molecules, then you will have two whole classes over that uh, when you get to organic chemistry. Uh, but for just for now, I want to point out that when it comes to organic molecules, um, you have to be a little bit more specific in the way that you uh, represent the, the basic structure of the molecule because uh, carbon is very versatile in the way that it can bond with things and so because of that um, there uh, it's not just good enough to know what atoms you have you actually have to have some kind of a clue as to how they're connected together so as an example here we have CH3 CH2OH this is how you would write the uh, the formula for uh, ethanol this is booze uh, and the way that it's written out gives you the clue that the Lewis structure is a carbon with three hydrogens attached to it, another carbon with two hydrogens attached to it, and then an oxygen with one hydrogen attached to it. And if you add up the uh, lone or the uh, electrons, you'll find that you have four missing, and those are the lone pairs on oxygen. On the other hand, this is dimethyl ether, a highly flammable, practically, well not practically, it is explosive uh, material, very dangerous. The way that this is written is also giving you a clue as to how uh, the atoms are arranged. So we have a carbon with three hydrogens attached to it, and then an oxygen attached to another carbon with three hydrogens attached to it and once again if you add up the electrons you'll have just enough to give the oxygen its two lone pairs so it has an octet. Now these two molecules are very very similar in some ways and very different in others. Um, they're similar in that they're both flammable although this one is much more flammable. Um, they're very different in other ways. Um, this like I said is booze uh, you can drink it, at least a certain amount of it, without hurting yourself. Um, this, as far as I'm aware, no, there's no good amount <laughs> or no acceptable amount of dimethyl ether uh, that you should ingest or breathe in. Um, they used to use ethers to knock people out for surgeries and things like that. I don't think it was dimethyl ether, but um, they would use uh, similar molecules. So they're very, very different and very similar in some ways, but one way that they are identical is in the atoms present. So if you notice, both of them are C2H6O, if you just write out the atoms. This is why we don't use this if we're trying to uh, tell someone that we have ethanol because you know if you tell them oh I have C2H6O like well do you have this one or do you have this one because both of those have the same atoms present so in organic molecules you have to be a little bit more specific in uh, how you uh, represent uh, the structure alright let's talk about bond energies so when we're looking at uh, bond energies, what, what we're trying to describe is, uh, number one, how strong the bond is, but the way that we do that is by giving the amount of energy that it takes to break the bond. So the bond energy that we're going to be looking at over the next couple slides is actually the amount of energy needed to break the bond. The idea being that the more energy it takes to break it, the stronger the bond is. Um, and so when we're looking at these numbers here on the next slide, a couple things we need to keep in mind. Uh, the bond energies, as they're listed there, are in the gas state. So it's a molecule that is in the gas state. It's not uh, dissolved in water. Uh, it's not in a solid state. Um, those do have uh, effects on the bond energies, not, not dramatic effects necessarily, but they do affect it somewhat. Uh, and this is also assuming that the bonds break homolytically which is to say that when the bond breaks, both of the atoms that are involved in the bond take half of the electrons that were involved. So if it's a single bond, both of them get one electron, double both get two, triple both get three. So they, they equally split 
the electrons. That is an assumption that uh, needs to be made here because it doesn't always happen that way and that will most assuredly affect the bond uh, energies. And so if we look at some bond energies here, at first it just looks like a whole bunch of mess of numbers and, and uh, letters. But we can find some trends here. Um, there's one trend in particular that is uh, easy to see. So for example, if we look at these three bonds here, carbon, carbon, single, carbon, carbon, double, and carbon, carbon, triple bonds. If we compare those three, as you would expect, because this is fairly intuitive, as you go from single to double to triple bonds, the bond strength increases. The bonds are stronger if there are more bonds. And like I said, this should be pretty intuitive. It's like, you know, if you you tie someone's hands together with, you know, floss, it's not very strong. Well, maybe if you double up the floss, okay, it's a little bit stronger now. Okay, now if you wrap it around it three times, okay, now it's, it's you know, it's not necessarily three times as strong, but it is stronger for sure. Uh, it's the same kind of idea here. If there's more stuff binding the two atoms together, the bond will, uh, the bond energy will increase. The amount of energy needed to break it will increase. Uh, and like I said, it is not exactly proportional where you have a single bond energy and the double bond is twice that. Sometimes it's pretty close. Uh, like in this case, it's decently close. Um, but uh, here, so you can see going from double to triple, that's nowhere near um, uh, doubling again. Um, or I guess it wouldn't necessarily be doubling again, but increasing by 50%. Uh, so it's not always going to work out that way, but it will always work out that going from single to double to triple bonds for the same kind of bond will always give you a stronger bond. Uh, and the reason I stipulate for the same kind of bond is because there are some situations where, you know, if you have a nitrogen and an oxygen bonded together, that is not the same bond strength as a carbon and carbon bonded together. So you can see here carbon, carbon is 347. Nitrogen, oxygen, which is still a single bond, but because it's different atoms involved in the bond, the bond is much weaker. It doesn't take as much energy to break it apart. And the nitrogen, nitrogen single bond is even weaker. It's, it's quite weak. Um, the nitrogen, nitrogen double bond is only slightly stronger than the carbon-carbon single bond. So the, the type of atoms involved in the bond also have an effect uh, on the, uh, the bond strength. Um, so the other trend that I want us to see, so the first part here is just describing the trend we talked about there. Yeah, triple is stronger than double, which is stronger than single. The other uh, trend is that shorter covalent bonds are stronger than uh, really long covalent bonds. So if we look at, uh, for example here, bromine bonded to fluorine, bromine bonded to chlorine, and bromine bonded to bromine. Bromine is the biggest atom involved in all of these bonds. Fluorine is the smallest. Because fluorine is small, the bond length here is shorter. Uh, there's there's not as much electron density on the fluorine, so the distance from one nucleus to the other, which is how those bond lengths are measured, it's the distance from one nucleus to the other nucleus, that is a lot shorter for the bromine-fluorine bond, and the bond strength is increased because of that. Really long bonds, this, this analogy isn't absolutely perfect, but you can kind of think about it in terms of like trying to break a twig. So if you have a, a twig or a branch or something that's, you know, a couple feet long, you can get a bit of torque on that. If you're trying to snap that, that twig in the middle, there's enough length in the bond there that you can get some torque on it to get that thing to break. Um, if it's a really short twig, if the twig is like, you know, two inches, it's difficult to get enough force to break that thing. Um, like I said, it's not a perfect analogy, but hopefully it helps you remember the shorter the bond length, the stronger the bond is. And you can see that with pretty much anything that you look at here. Um, and so this is kind of uh, just talking about uh, the different bond lengths and how it relates to the size of the atom here. So iodine is uh, the biggest of the halogens, or, well, 
the ones we normally look at anyway. There is one that's bigger. Um, astatine, I think. I forget what it's called. But um, uh, iodine is the biggest that we normally see, and it has by far the biggest bond length. Um, it's uh, almost twice as big as uh, fluorine. And so this bond is a lot weaker. And so the thing to keep in mind here is that bond length and bond strength are inversely proportional. As one increases, the other one decreases. As the bond length is going up, getting longer, the strength of the bond is decreasing. And so you can see here um, the opposite trend that we saw on the previous slide there, going from single to double to triple bonds, gave us more bond energy, uh, but it is decreasing the bond length here because they're sharing more electrons. They're pulling each other in closer to one another, um, which uh, is part of the reason why those bond energies are higher. All right, I think we'll call it there for this video, a little shorter video this time, uh, and then we'll jump into VSEPR or VSEPR in the next one.